Greetings, friends, fellow Earthlings, and those who wish to boldly explore strange new worlds. Welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. I'm your host, Dr. Graham, the Cosmobiologist Lau, and we're brought to you as always by the NASA Astrobiology Program and SaganNet.org. Now, before I introduce our guest for today, as always, we want to thank those of you out there who interact with our guests by asking questions through the chat during the live show on YouTube, who reach out to them after the show to ask questions, or who use the hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter before the show to just let us know that you, you love what we're doing and that you, you enjoy hearing from our guests about astrobiology and about their careers and their passions. Uh, this month, we want to thank at Prince underscore Indrajit on Twitter, uh, Prince Indrajit uh, parentheses law on Twitter for sharing about our show. Uh, again, if you ask really cool questions or you have cool ideas to share about astrobiology with our guests, we're more than happy to give you a shout out on our show. Now, in astrobiology, many of us want to explore strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilizations. And so we boldly go doing the work of exploring diverse topics and, and adding our own little piece to our collective human knowledge about life in the universe and our place in the cosmos. And today's guest is certainly someone who has a breadth of interest and in, throughout planetary science and astrobiology. Uh, Dr. Michael L. Wong is a NASA Sagan postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie Science Earth and Planets Laboratory, studying planetary atmospheres, habitability, biosignatures, and the emergence of life. He earned his bachelor's at UC Berkeley and then a master's and a PhD in planetary science at Caltech. He was then also previously a researcher at University of Washington before taking on his current role at Carnegie. In his spare time, um, and I know a lot of our, our audience watching love this, he hosts a podcast called Strange New Worlds, where they examine the science and technology and culture through the lens of Star Trek. So, uh, Dr. Michael Wong, welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist. Thanks, Graham. It's wonderful to be here with the cosmobiologist himself. I'm such a big fan of all of your work and this show, too. Ask an Astrobiologist is one of my favorites. I love tuning in, and it's just such an honor to be here myself. Well, thank you so much for that. I, I know our audience is super excited to hear about everything you do, and they want to hear about Star Trek, and I, I promise we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> but first, before we get there, we love to just humanize scientists, those working in astrobiology, people want to know, like, how do you get there? And, and what really, what really, you know, strokes your passion to become this kind of person in the world. And so the one thing I love to ask everyone when they first come on the show is what was your origin story that got you involved in this career pursuit? Well, I mean, I guess we're going to jump straight to Star Trek because it all started when I was really young, just, uh, you know, a little kid uh, watching Star Trek with my dad, um, you know, getting really inspired. I grew up in the 90s, so surrounded by the next generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, that kind of like ethos of Star Trek all around me. And uh, you know, just fell in love with outer space and the idea of, you know, seeking out new life and new civilizations, exploring strange new worlds. And I thought, what career path is that? And, you know, uh, when I got to college, I was shopping around for a major. I thought, you know, I heard about this astrobiology thing. I really want to be an astrobiologist because they sound like they do really cool things. Can I do that? And it turned out that no, um, where I went to college, UC Berkeley, at the time, and I think it still is the case, uh, as, as with many places uh, around the globe, doesn't have an astrobiology major. So I was sort of like bummed out and stumbled upon the uh, geobiology uh, desk and, and, and the, the geobiology folks told me, hey, you know, uh, you, you might be interested in this new major we're starting called planetary science. Uh, it sort of is a mix of disciplines, very interdisciplinary. And the more I learned about it, the more I fell in love with planetary science. And I said to my Myself, hey, if I can't be an astrobiologist, if I can't study aliens yet, maybe I'll just study where aliens might live. Uh, and so I majored in planetary science that took me to do um, a PhD in planetary science as well. 
But all the while, I, I really wanted to chase those astrobiological questions. You know, are we alone and where did we come from? So I made sure to try to steer my path in planetary science towards projects in my PhD that had something to do with astrobiology, whether it was the formation of organic molecules in Titan's atmosphere and Pluto's atmosphere, or the creation of potentially protobiotic molecules on the early Earth and early Mars. Uh, so I, I view, I, I come to astrobiology through the lens of planetary atmosphere. Spheres. That's what I did my PhD studying. Uh, and then that launched me into my postdoc, my first postdoc at the University of Washington, where I thought about biosignatures on exoplanets, and now to where I am at Carnegie, uh, where I'm continuing that trend. Oh, that's so cool. And I will say, in prep for this episode, I looked at your CV, and, and two things. One, it's the most beautiful CV I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, but two, I, I noticed that in your publications, like you really have touched on so many different planetary bodies. You've done work on exoplanets and Pluto and Titan and Mars and Earth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, What was that pathway for you that you really thought to yourself, like, I'm going to work on a little bit of everything? Yeah, it's a winding pathway. And to be honest, you don't always get to choose, especially when you're in grad school and you, you know, you're, you're kind of uh, in a research group and you're trying to, you have to fit into the, the larger group's direction, right? And so sometimes you get handed a project from your PI, but the further and further that I get in academia, the more I kind of have control over things. And you're right. I do try to touch upon everything, uh, anything that is astrobiologically interesting, right? Um, and so like one of the recent papers papers that I published was actually uh, led by uh, a student, Adriana Gomez Buckley, uh, simulating a virus sphere on Europa. And, you know, I, I study planetary atmospheres mostly. Um, and it, it turns out that, you know, the types of equations that uh, describe bacterial viral interactions, these differential equations that describe their dynamics are not too dissimilar from the types of equations that uh, you use to model chemical reactions within an atmosphere. So I thought that, you know, hey, we, we could actually do this project. Adriana was just so enthusiastic about it and really took charge developing the model. Uh, and, you know, now I can say I've published on Europa, too, even though that body barely has an atmosphere. <laughs> Oh, I love that so much. And I, I will say, I, I know Adriana. Uh, she was in our Young Scientist program at Blue Marble Space yeah. this past summer. She's now a visiting scholar at the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. And she's working through the Center for Life Detection on a web tool called the Life Detection Knowledge Base that I am also part of. And so it's really cool to know her. I know her father, Ray Buckley, also watches Ask an Astrobiologist. And so <laughs> you can be tuning in right now. Yeah. Um, and so it's very cool to hear that. And I, I think for the young people maybe viewing who are maybe in high school or undergraduate college students, there are lots of ways to get involved in really cool research like that. And if you feel like there's not astrobiology at your college or you want to go to a college that doesn't have astrobiology, just like Mike and myself even, I didn't get a degree in astrobiology. And yet many of us come to astrobiology through other pursuits and we, we reach out to people to work on projects. And so Mike, I, I think a question I have there as well then for you uh, for those who are watching who maybe want to become astrobiologists, do you have any recommendations for them and how to find good mentors, how to find programs that really, that really fit their passions? Yeah. So I, I, I like to say that astrobiology is a science of questions, you know, and, and there's so many ways to be an astrobiologist. You could come at it from geology, from astronomy, from biology, chemistry, computer science, you can come from any kind of background. So go and major in something that you're really passionate about and then use the tools and knowledge that you're gaining in school to ask an astrobiological question. Because as no matter what kind of science you're doing, whether it's in a lab or in the field or at a telescope or just on your computer, if you're asking an astrobiology question, then you are an astrobiologist. Yeah, absolutely. As Mary Wojtek always says, anyone can be an astrobiologist. You don't have to have necessary certain degrees in the sciences and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so cool to hear about, you know, some of your your pathway doing, you know, from, from Berkeley to Caltech to University of Washington and, and now to the, the Carnegie Institute. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, you know, what does a day in the life look like for you when you're working at Carnegie? <laughs> wow. Uh, it's, it's so varied, you know, and the most exciting thing for me is getting to talk to other people. Um, and the, 
beautiful thing about astrobiology is that it's so interdisciplinary. On any given week, you know, I'll be talking to mineralogists or organic chemists, uh, talking to data scientists and to philosophers and mathematicians too. Um, so a day in the life honestly looks like trading ideas with other people. And then of course, taking those ideas and doing the hard work of calculating, you know, simulating an atmosphere in the case of, uh, of, of myself and also um, advising students. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm advising several students right now, and we're all we're working on exciting projects, again, simulating the atmospheres of planetary bodies uh, within and beyond the shores of our solar system. Um, so it's a lot of computer work for me, but then a lot of really just joy in, in trading ideas with other people and trying to learn, honestly, from all of these different people. I think I'm going to be a lifelong learner because I know there is so much I don't know, um, but that is important to this quest. No, I love that so much. Yeah, there, there's so much that we can bring in from other people and, and so many ways for us to sculpt our ideas by talking to people, especially those from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that. And I see that we actually have a bunch of audience questions rolling in already <laughs> through the chat and YouTube. Uh, we have a few from Twitter already. Um, but before we open it up to the audience Q&A, we have a bunch more to talk about. One, I, I want to hear a bit more about some of your recent research. Sure. Um, two of your papers that I read that really intrigued me. One, um, you had a paper from 2020 called Defining Life in the Universe from Three Privileged Functions to Four Pillars. Yeah. And I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that with you. One, the, the title of this paper says Defining Life, but it's life with an, a Y. <laughs> yeah. Why? Right. Um, why is that? That's a great question, Graham. So basically, this this paper, which I co-authored with uh, Dr. Stuart Bartlett, one of my closest friends and colleagues, he's um, a staff scientist at Caltech. Uh, we were trying to just think about, you know, when we search for life in the universe, what are we actually talking about? And when we are asking questions about the origin of life on Earth or on other planets, what are we talking about there? And there are kind of two separate questions, we think. One is, you know, the historical question of how did life exactly as we know it here on Earth come about? And that question, you know, has attracted the attention of thousands of scholars over many years writing about this uh, conundrum of where did we come from? But then there's also the question of how in general might a living system, one that looks like us or one that produces a completely different kind of biochemistry and operation, come about? And what are the general principles of life? And what are the general principles of life that you might look for in an alien biosphere that has taken many different evolutionary tur turns? And so how can we define life or characterize life or come up with some just tentative criteria for what life might be um, that doesn't use our specific, you know, molecular toolbox and use DNA and proteins and et cetera, um, maybe not, is not even cellular in nature. Uh, what are the kind of like abstract general principles that we want to look for when we are asking, did I find life out there or did I make life in my lab from scratch? Um, and so, we define life with a Y as any system that performs uh, four just fundamental processes. We like to say life is a verb, not a noun. You know, it's not specific substrate, but it's it's anything that does these four things. One is dissipation. That's basically harnessing energy, right? Uh, autocatalysis, the ability to grow exponentially under ideal conditions. Homeostasis, the ability to kind of, you know, uh, buffer yourself against external changes, fluctuations, perturbations. And then the last one is learning, the ability to intake and process information to increase your survival and persistence. Uh, and life as we know it, life of the I, is one subset of the possibilities, the grand possibilities for life of the Y. And uh, we just wanted to introduce this new term to the community so that somebody could say, I'm designing a biosignature technique to look for life of the Y, you know, which is perhaps a different kind of technique than you would use to look specifically for life with an I. Yeah, I love that so much. It makes me wonder. So, so uh, viruses. Where would you see viruses kind of falling in that scale, especially with regard to learning and to information processing? Oh, such a good question. Yeah. So we devote a paragraph in the paper to this where we kind of walk ourselves through. Okay, viruses. So a, a single virion alone, just like in isolation, 
does none of the four pillars of life, right? It just sits there. Uh, but if you put that vi virion in contact with the bacterium and give it the necessary nutrients and energy source that the bacterium would need, then the, the virus could infect the bacterium, create a viral factory that does dissipation through the metabolism of the bacterium and autocatalysis through the replication of the virus. Um, and then if you have a, a system of viruses and bacteria in a changing environment where they're kind of adapting to each other's strategies of infection and uh, defense, that could also be, uh, you could tack on learning there through evolution, right? So evolution is the primary learning process here uh, on earth throughout the billions of years of, of our planet's history. So, okay, so that's three of them. And then, you know, uh, we already talked about Adriana's paper about how viruses can create homeostatic uh, mechanisms in a system, you know, by recycling certain nutrients, dissolved organic matter, for instance, that keep the system actually propped up and surviving longer than if the viruses weren't there. Uh, uh, and so that is, you know, that that is all four pillars, dissipation, autocatalysis, homeostasis, and learning. So the example of viruses is really fun to think about, but I also think it really gets at this fundamental idea that you want to look at life at the system level, because actually nothing is going to be alive for very long in isolation. Even myself, if I blocked myself off from like all of the people that support me through the various activities, farming, or from the trees that create oxygen for me to breathe, I'm going to be dead very soon. So we got to assess life at the system level, potentially even at the planetary level. And that gives us hope for looking for life, say, on exoplanets. Yeah, I love that concept so much. You know, life happens to a planet, not just on a planet. You know, like yeah. worlds become living things themselves almost. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really like, like, like that. And I, I like this, this thing in astrobiology that really, you know, it kind of got me interested right away is that, you know, we don't know, but here's how we could find out. Here's how we can start approaching some of these problems about things like figuring out what's alive and what's not alive out there. It's also, you know, for a very long time, we've been wondering when we look up at the sky at night, why haven't we really found definitive evidence yet? Why haven't we met ET? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and some people will argue that they're visiting us right now, but we really don't <laughs> have definitive evidence that it's happening yet. True. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit then um, about your 2022 paper from earlier this year, mm -hmm. Asymptotic Burnout and Homeostatic Awakening, A Possible Solution to the Fermi Paradox. Yeah. Now, I, I really love this paper. It kind of speaks to me as a nerd for science fiction, but mm -hmm. also someone who really likes applying science to what's possible. Uh, right. You know, So we don't know, but here's how we can find out. Now, in this paper, you both, and, and again, this is also co-author with Stuart Bartlett, uh, you start mm -hmm. off in this paper making an analogy to the growth of cities yeah. uh, and how there are singularities in growth or crises that can occur, and then there, there needs to be some kind of innovative reset occurring that kind of allows for the population to continue going and to continue growing without hitting this crisis in population growth that could be detrimental. Um, and then you apply that to planetary civilizations. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts for how we can apply that to a planetary civilization and what that means then for, for answering the Fermi paradox. Right. So as you said, Graham, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's an analogy that can be made between cities and stars where stars are these like nuclear reactors. And we know from astrophysics that the larger a star is, the faster it burns its fuel and the sooner it dies out and explodes. Um, cities too, um, you know, the larger a city is, the more social interactions happen per time. And so the, the life, the, the, the pace of life in cities actually increases the larger a city is. People actually have been measured to walk faster in larger cities. Um, and so, you know, as, as cities grow uh, on the earth, but then also as cities start to talk to one another, this, these are us, the, us social agents, you know, uh, I'm sitting probably thousands of miles away from where you are right now, but we're talking through our computers. Isn't that amazing? No longer uh, do we need to have these um, physical constraints on human interaction through our technology and what uh, Dr. Caleb Scharf, uh, also an astrobiologist, calls the data ohm. We are able to share information and have these social interactions um, at an unprecedented rate and scale, and that could drive then this sort of uh, this this um, singularity, this burnout, to occur at the planetary scale. Um, uh, this is just a hypothesis, of course. The whole paper is really a, a hypothesis for where we might be going as a planetary civilization, and if you can extrapolate that and generalize 
opposite to exocivilizations too, under these principles, as long as there are social interacting agents that aren't physically limited in those social interactions, once they develop essentially the alien equivalent of Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, uh, then you know you might get some kind of scaling law that causes them to grow in this super linear fashion that ends up causing a uh, potential catastrophe. Oh, that's fantastic. I, before we talk then about this possibility for a homostatic awakening, mm -hmm. um, you brought up something there interesting, like people walk faster in cities in general. And that makes me wonder about alien civilizations and perception of time. Mm. Um, could it be that you know a civilization that's growing faster or growing larger or a world that's growing faster, growing quicker and progressing quicker perceives time differently because of how it's developed its society around it? Yeah, I think that's a really intriguing question. And I wouldn't be surprised... I'm not exactly sure if I'm qualified to talk about this. Not a, you know, I'm not a psychologist or a social scientist in any uh, any fashion, and I, I certainly perceive my my knowledge of the perception of time is super local to myself. I don't study uh, this uh, as an academic discipline, um, but you know, just knowing about the pace of life in the various places that I've lived, and also the various stages of my own life, uh, how you know, class would just tick on forever when I was young, but nowadays, an hour long talk just goes by in a flash and I'm like, where did the time go? Um, you know, I, I, I can definitely see that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I, I do see more questions coming in from the audience. I promise everyone I will get to your questions very soon. I will say, though, uh, one of my favorite things in this paper, Mike, um, there's a figure where, where you show like a, a bimodal distribution of possible lifetimes of civilizations. And you show how like there's a, a large clump that maybe maybe that they, they burn out. Maybe they come through mm -hmm. this asymptotic burnout. And then there's another clump where they've gone through this process of homeostatic awakening, longer lived civilizations. And I, I love the L factor in the Drake equation. It's always been my, my favorite part of that equation because it speaks mm -hmm. so much to our existential understanding of our own mortality uh, as individuals, but also our own lifetime as a civilization, um, possibly being impacted by things like nuclear warfare and our, our inability to change ourselves. Um, so how do, how do you envision that this homeostatic awakening impacting civilizations once they become aware of this existential process, this, this understanding? Yeah, exactly. So um, we define this homeostatic awakening as the idea that you can consciously, you know, transition yourself and uh, rewrite the fundamental way that society works in a way that isn't going to uh, hit a burnout and that you can then start exploring other ways of, you know, knowing and ex uh, expanding throughout the universe. Uh, and I, I think that the, the, the actually, well, just going back to the L, uh, the, the, the L factor in the Drake equation, this whole thing started when I was invited to speak about the L variable um, on a panel at a conference. And I was like, what can I possibly say about this thing? Like, there's no way to estimate it. But maybe what I can say is that it could be bimodal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and that you know there will be a subset of uh, planetary civilizations that don't get a chance to realize that they're on a burnout trajectory, or maybe do realize it but aren't able to reorient themselves and uh, to prioritize homeostasis over uh, this kind of flagrant uh, autocatalysis growth with no end, except then you fall off a cliff. Um, and then there's the other clump of civilizations that sort of realize, awaken to the fact that, hey, we're in charge of our planetary civilization, uh, of, of our, of our planet. We, we're going to integrate ourselves into our planet's geospheres in a self-productive, self-maintaining way, consciously. Uh, and then uh, as, as David Grinspoon and Adam Frank and others have written, you may enter a completely new eon of, of, of being at the planetary scale where you are essentially, um, you know, I, I don't want to say like just not able to be killed or go, go away because who knows what might happen. Uh, but, uh, but, but if, but if a, a conscious civilization is able to integrate itself very productively, uh, intimately into its natural environment, it could last for a very long time. And also, be potentially be very difficult to, to detect, right? Because it may be indistinguishable from nature. Mm, indeed. And you mentioned something that just like popped in my head. You mentioned a conscious civilization. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, you know, we, we don't really know what life is yet. 
And we also don't really know what consciousness is either. So for those watching, if you're interested, there's a whole realm of astrobiology to study in the realm of, of what life is and what consciousness is and, and whether we are fully conscious or if there's some other realm of it there. Um, I will say in this paper, one thing that like sprung into my mind while I was reading it um, is the, 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 the species called the Nox in the, in the show Stargate SG-1. Um, <laughs> they're like this... There's this species that humans meet on another planet, um, they're humanoid, and they seem very like primitive, basic. And later in the show, you find out that they're extremely technologically advanced, but they're so advanced that, that their technology appears like magic. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of that quote from Arthur C. Clarke, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And it makes me wonder when reading your paper, do you feel like they're, these worlds that have gone through homeostatic awakening – Will we even recognize them or would they be magic? Would they be something kind of beyond our comprehension? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. And I think that what we're looking at here is just the the idea that life on Earth throughout its four billion years or so of evolution has gone through many major transitions, you know, in in uh ways of processing information, uh, ways of harnessing energy, and units of selection as well. Um, And so, you know, just as, you know, a colony of bacteria couldn't have predicted ant colonies, and just as an ant colony couldn't have predicted uh, a, a, a city, right, what can't we predict about what next major transition in evolution and organizational scale uh, will, will, will come? You know, it's, it's, it's hard for us to do that kind of prediction when these things are sort of step functions or, you know, um, just because of the way that emergence happens, it's just so difficult to know. And one thing that I just want to emphasize about this paper is that you look back through these series of major transitions, uh, and there's no reason to believe that we're done with them. In fact, I think we're going through one right now with this technological revolution. Um, And so... Where exactly is that going to lead us? Could be leading us to something like the Knox, could be leading us to any number of other possibilities. But to simply extrapolate, okay, because human civilization spread across our globe in this sort of like uh, colonialistic um, manner, and then just to say, okay, well, then therefore other civilizations out there that have achieved some kind of planetary, um, you know, uh, dominance will then continue to try to just go and dominate other planets in that same sort of manner is pretty naive, I think, when we realize, okay, maybe there's something that necessitates a new transition to something else. And in in the case of our paper, we suggest uh, homeostatic awakening that then changes the behavior of civilizations uh, as they explore the galaxy. I love that. Now, I will say, just for time's sake, I, I do have to bring it back to Earth a little bit now. I just want to hear a little bit more about your, your current research. You know, recently we, we've now, I mean, James Webb Space Telescope has only been operating for a few months, really, like, you know, since it first started collecting light. And already we, we have data from exoplanet atmospheres about water and hazes and the very first carbon dioxide detection in an exoplanet atmosphere from JWST. Yeah. There's more data certainly coming around the corner. Um, you know, I, I know that we've already looked at a few of the really intri- interesting worlds in the Goldilocks zone around their stars. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, you, you talked to me before the show about your current work and looking at exoplanet biosignatures, exoplanet gases. I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about what you're currently working on and what we might expect in the coming year or so from you. For sure. So, you know, you mentioned JWST. Uh, what a wonderful instrument. Um, I, with this telescope, we are finally able to sort of scratch the surface of the question of whether or not there are biosignatures on exoplanets. Previous to this, we really couldn't do that kind of measurement. So now we're finally able to, to try to answer that question. And it's mainly by looking at the chemistry of those planets' atmospheres. Can we detect the metabolic gases that are indicative of life? So CO2, for instance, is one really good one. Uh, looking for water vapor, looking for methane, looking for oxygen, these are others. Uh, one thing that I'm trying to pioneer right now is using the tools of network science to try to understand if there's something about the holistic network of atmospheres chemistry that we might one day detect 
in an exoplanet's atmosphere using JWST, but also using things that will come after it, the lo extremely large ground-based telescopes that are being built around the world, whatever comes after JWST in space, uh, will be required to get the full picture of what uh, all of the atmospheric chemistry on a planet is doing. And the reason why we're looking at this holistic picture is, again, to try to identify signs of life as we don't know it, life with a Y. Maybe life on other planets in other geochemical contexts start to use different molecules in their metabolisms and put different gases into their atmospheres. Um, but in general, also, we're also thinking about this idea that what does life do? What actually, you know, what, what does life do to chemistry in general? And I think that life reorganizes the structures of flows of matter and energy and information into a highly non-random, complex, functional network. And you can see this even at the biochemical scale. If you look at biochemical networks, like all the chemistry that happens inside of a cell, it's not a random network. It's highly sculpted by the enzymes and the proteins in that cell, the activities of those molecular machines. If you look at the networks of our neurons, our brains. They have a very telling architecture. It's not random either. If you look at the networks of food webs, you know, uh, in ecosystems, again, you see this very similar kind of network structure. And what we're finding in our research right now is that Earth's atmospheric chemical network, all of the chemistry that is happening in front of your face right now, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, also has some of those network structural motifs. So could it be that what life does is it reorganizes flows of matter, energy, and information at every single scale, from the tiniest microscopic scale to the planetary scale as a whole, to basically perform its functions and maintain homeostasis and increase the amount of learning that it does. Um, and so that's something that we're chasing. It's giving us a window into exoplanet biosignatures that hasn't really been developed so far. And I think the mantra in biosignatures is multiple lines of evidence, right? There may not be one smoking gun biosignature for any given world, but if you're able to approach it uh, from different kinds of, uh, with, with different kinds of techniques and different kinds of measurements, um, then you can raise your confidence in the idea that we've detected life on a certain planet. And this network biosignature technique that we're developing right now hopefully adds to our arsenal of ways to scan for biosignatures on exoplanets. Oh, that's a that's a great segue for us to then discuss some Star Trek too. Sure, like in Star Trek, we can you know fly a spaceship up to a world and just scan the world from above <laughs> and and say, oh yeah, there's life signs. Scanning for life signs, right? Um, on Twitter, on, on the at NASA Astro Bio account, we we asked our audience um, of some certain Star Trek technologies, which is actually based on known science, and the options were hollow deck, replicator, tricorder, or tractor beam. Now, I will say that Tricorder won by a good bit. It was 38% for the Tricorder. <laughs> Second place was Replicator, and then Holodeck and Tractor Beam were kind of together. But even within our team at Ask an Astrobiologist and with NASA Astrobiology and SeganNet, we've been kind of arguing <laughs> over what might be the right <laughs> answer here. Um, so how would you answer that question? Wow. So the four options, love them all. Uh, love those texts on Star Trek. Uh, I think that each one of them has a little glimmer of truth to it. You know, there's something you can point to in our technosphere right now that you could say that is a really, really, really primitive precursor of blah, you know, one of those, one of those uh, options there, you know, so we've got like, uh, uh, 3D printing, right? So that's sort of like a replicator. I like to think of replicator and holodeck technology as actually like two sides of the same coin. I feel like they're <laughs> they're kind of the same in Star Trek. We can talk about that later. Um, but then, you know, when, when we're talking about tricorders, as an astrobiologist, I wish I had a tricorder, but the uh, truth of the matter is we're still developing those techniques to go and look for life out there uh, that hopefully will be cataloged in um, that, uh, that, 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 uh, Biosignatures, I'm blanking on the name right now. I should know this. Uh, the the thing that you're all building at Enfold. Um, yeah, the knowledge base. The knowledge base, of course. Yeah, the knowledge base, right? So that could actually be the first sort of database for a tricorder, right? I, I would love to see that happen. But we're still building it right now. Uh, and then what do we have? Uh, you know, the the tractor beam, you know, at the, at the tiniest scales, I feel like we can do sort of tractor technology, but nowhere near doing it with a spacecraft yet. 
Yeah. No, those are great answers. Um, I agree entirely. There's little bits of the real science going in, on in all of these things in science fiction. And science and science fiction have always kind of paired off together. And you are someone who is great to ask questions about Star Trek since you are the host of the podcast, Strange New Worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to, one, just hear about you know your view, your vision of what this podcast is and, and maybe even tell our audience, why should they go listen to the podcast immediately after this show? Oh, wow. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for letting me talk about it a little bit. It's one of my passions to help share science, you know. Um, So I'm a a NASA fellow right now. So that means my money comes from you, like the the citizens, right? Your taxpayer dollars at work. And so I actually feel a really strong, um, you know, urge to share the wonders of the universe with everybody because everybody is deserving of it. Uh, And in fact, many of you contribute to it. Um, And so it's really uh, a passion of mine. And so the way that this originated was when I was in grad school, I was thinking about, oh gosh, I don't have a lot of opportunities to do science communication. Maybe I should just start a podcast that blends two things that I love so much that I just cannot stop talking about. So it's going to go well, of course, right? Uh, Star Trek and science. Um, And so uh, over the years, we've had lots of guests who have uh, are scientists like myself who are inspired by Star Trek, but also recently we've we've had people who uh, have helped craft the Star Trek universe. Some of the actual science consultants on the show, um, you know, uh, Dr. Aaron McDonald, an astrophysicist, Dr. Mohammed Noor, who is a geneticist, uh, have come on board to tell us about how they've injected a little bit of science into the latest Star Trek series, um, and also some of the writers of the Star Trek novels and some of the Star Trek cast members themselves who portray science officers. So it's been a real blast. If you like Star Trek or you're interested in learning more about Star Trek or just want to hear about science through through a unique lens, um, then I encourage you to check out Strange New Worlds, a science and Star Trek podcast. Awesome. I love it. And you've also now given talks about science at Star Trek conventions too, right? Yes. Oh, that's such a thrill to, um, to, to be able to engage the fan base. And, you know, at the, the latest convention in Chicago, uh, May 2022, you know, they put me actually uh, opposite of the Strange New Worlds TV show panel, uh, where Anson Mound, Captain Pike himself, was, uh, was giving a talk in, in the big ballroom. And I was, you know, in a much smaller room. And I was worried that nobody was going to show up. But uh, apparently quite a few people uh, wanted to hear about astrobiology over seeing ants in mountain live. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love that your podcast, it's not just the science. It's also talking to the writers and the creators. I'm yeah. um, talking about, you know, issues in inclusion and diversity in mm-hmm. the show and in the world and philosophy in Star Trek and things like that. Um, you know, one of my favorite scenes from all of Trek is in the second season of TNG, there's an episode called Samaritan Snare. Mm -hmm. Uh, The episode itself, it's not the best episode, but there's a scene in that episode where where Captain Picard and Wesley Crusher are in a shuttlecraft together, and they're flying to this star base, and they have a conversation where Captain Picard asks uh, young Crusher if he read this book of poetry that he gave him. And Wesley says, you know, no, it's not going to be on my exams. And there's this moment where, where Captain Picard kind of like looks out at the stars around and he says like the most important things won't be that anyone can learn to pilot a starship, but to really you know, make sense of it, you have to do more. You have to take in art and history and culture and then that makes all of this make sense. Uh, and so I love that you're kind of engaging with that as well. And I'd also like to just talk just for a moment before we move on um, a bit about you. You're also a really good graphic designer and you're really into photography. Like your, your Twitter feed is incredible. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear a bit about like what, what was your interest in that realm of art, art and, and graphic design and photography? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I mean, it's... It, I view science as a human endeavor. It's just one of the things that I do as a human being. And I've got other interests too. So when I was in high school, throughout college, and then also in graduate school, I was a part of the yearbook team at all of those various institutions, uh, learning graphic design, typography, journalism. I really love journalism. Again, it plays into my passion for science communication uh, and photography as well, just like capturing the moment of all of the cool things that we do as humans and also of uh, Mother Earth, you know, nature and things like that. Um, And I found that actually all of those other activities and talents that I developed 
play a huge role in science now because, you know, as scientists, we're not just responsible for doing science. We are responsible for so many other things too. Uh, when we craft a talk or prepare a paper for submission, we have to do a little bit of graphic design to make figures look accessible and appealing to people. Um, and w when we uh, are, are engaging with the public right now, you know, we, we're public speakers, we're storytellers and spokespeople um, for, for ambassadors for science, essentially. And so learning about the humanities, learning about how to engage with other people, learning about aesthetics and art uh, can actually enhance, I think, uh, a scientist and the scientific experience. And so I try to wrap all of that together into uh, who I am and embrace it all and, and try to, you know, ignore all the haters who say, like, if you spend too much time doing something else, you're not being a serious scientist because it all actually contributes to my science and who I am. All right, I appreciate that so much. And I'm so glad to have you on the show to hear of your unique perspective. Now, much like in Star Trek with warp drive, taking the stars flying past us really quick. We now want to jump to our faster than light segment. So I'm going to ask a few questions and if you could get the answers to like 30 seconds or so, sure. um, just, you know, it's kind of fun just for the audience to hear kind of your thoughts about some of these questions. Um, first off, we might know the answer, the answer to this already. <laughs> What's your favorite answer to Fermi's question? Where are they? Yeah, so uh, I think my favorite answer to this is that we're just we're just too young as a civilization. You know, we haven't been around long enough to explore and listen to a large enough volume of space or hyper volume of space and frequencies and all this other things. Uh, and we also haven't been long enough uh, around long enough to just learn how to best listen. You know, if something goes through a homeostatic awakening, it may no longer be emitting or transmitting on the types of uh, frequencies uh, or technologies that we're used to. So I think we just need to literally become what we're trying to find a long lived planetary civilization before we can go and find it. Mm. So what stories have inspired you to want to explore more about life in the universe? I mean, Star Trek, right? So <laughs> uh, one, one of the, one of the, my favorite characters on Star Trek is the uh, doctor from Star Trek Voyager. So this is a, a hologram uh, and uh, he was programmed for just one thing and one thing only to do medicine really, really well. Um, but throughout the course of the seven seasons of Star Trek Voyager, he starts to add new subroutines to his program and, you know, becomes a, a singer, a photographer, um, you know, a, just a dreamer. And and I, for me, I think this ties into what we were talking about just before. It was like trying to integrate all these aspects of humanity into oneself and to realize that, um, you know, you, you get to define who you are, not some programmer or creator or teacher or mentor of yours telling you what you need to do, but you get to choose what your path looks like and what you like to do. I love that. I will say... I'm now a father. I have a three-year-old child now. Um, I went back recently and did a rewatch of Voyager, the episode where the doctor creates his own family. Um, I'm almost going to cry right now. Uh, it really it yeah. hit very hard yeah. uh, being a father. And so if, if you enjoy uh, emotional things too, there's also a lot of great depth of emotion in Star Trek to explore for our audience. Um, so if you could go back in time and visit yourself at the very beginning of your career, what advice would you give? Um, take more computer science courses <laughs> because programming is a large chunk of what I do. Uh, and honestly, it's kind of painful sometimes. <laughs> I won't lie. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of the subjects that I've had uh, in classes that really inspired me were because of the teachers. Uh, and so I was really lucky to have great biology teachers, great physics teachers, great chemistry teachers. Um, but uh, I, I think I, I would have wanted to give myself more of a chance to get really inspired as a computer scientist too. Um, that's something that I would go back in time and tell myself to do more of. All right. What is something that excites you about the future? Something that excites me about the future. Wow. Uh, I think that we're entering a golden age of astrobiology. You know, we're building missions uh, and, and telescopes that will be tasked literally with the job of trying to identify habitable environments and look for signs of life in other worlds. Um, and, you know, this from Europa to uh, Titan to exoplanets. It's just going to be a glorious next couple of decades. And I can't wait to see what, what surprises find us because if anything, 
uh, has been learned from our, uh, our, our history in uh, exploring planetary science is that we've got to expect the unexpected. There are so many wonders out there, not all of which will be due to life. You know, there will be unexpected geology, too. And so our task is really hard to disentangle unexpected geological findings and atmospheric findings from those truly wondrous biological findings. I love that so much. All right. One more question. Okay. What's an unbelievable science fact that still blows your mind? <laughs> wow. Um, this is so hard to pick just one. You know, uh, if you think about any science fact long enough, I feel like it'll blow your mind. <laughs> and I say that science is the greatest underdog story ever. You know, our senses, our minds, we're not evolved to you know, characterize exoplanets or understand quantum mechanics or know about neutrinos or dark matter. And yet we do anyway. Um, and so I think that there are still so many unknowns, but the fact that we are on this journey, trying to identify our place in the universe, uh, asking these cosmic questions, and the fact that we know anything at all is is the science fact that blows my mind the most, um, that we are here part of the universe understanding itself. I love that so much. We we think, therefore, we are, right? Yeah. Um, I love it. Uh, so I will go to the audience Q&A now. I realized I, I stole so much of our time here just talking to you. I could nerd out with you for hours, honestly, <laughs> over lots of things, Star Trek, exoplanets, astrobiology, and more. Um, but I do want to give the audience their, their chance to ask some questions. And, and the first one comes from Jim Pass, uh, who heads the Astrosociology Research Institute. Uh, and he usually asks very good questions about sociology and, and how they kind of impact our science. In this case, he asks a Star, que a Star Trek question <laughs> um, regarding the prime directive and first contact. Mm -hmm. uh, if we detect intelligent life, maybe through evidence of techno signatures, how do you think we should move forward as human Starfleet? Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. Uh, love thinking about it. I think in in the near term, you know, real the reality of a techno signature will be that there's probably no imminent need to take any kind of action. If we get a signal from very far away, you know, it might be uh, dozens to hundreds, maybe thousands light years away, however long away it is, you know, the travel time is going to be so long. It's not going to be like talking over Zoom with, with a buddy, right? Um, so we have time to figure things out. And I think the most important thing that we need to do is to collectively, as a planetary civilization, um, as ambassadors of Earth, decide what to do um, together. And I think that one of the most amazing things that a techno signature could give us is that kind of opportunity, that table uh, around which to, 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 to congregate and have those meaningful conversations as a species, not as you know a bunch of people from this nation and that nation, but really all of as, as citizens from earth. So I hope that we take the time to craft our message together with intent and purpose and, and compassion, um, because we probably will have that time. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's basically my hope. I don't know what we would say necessarily. Um, but I, I hope we take the opportunity to use it to bind our species together more. I love that. Um, user at Hazi Wu on Twitter, they ask a few questions about your background that you've already addressed in the episode. But one thing that they wanted to know is if you would recommend a certain area at the university that students who want to study astrobiology should, should study themselves to learn more about a certain realm of astrobiology. Well, so um, I mean, like I said, Anybody can be an astrobiologist. You can come at it from any major. Uh, but what I did actually uh, to learn more about astrobiology at my institutions was to start a journal club, to start a weekly series of meetings and invite people from all sorts of different disciplines to come together. We'd read a paper and we'd learn from each other because everybody has something different to bring to the table, a different insight. There are lots of times when I was confused and I was like, I don't understand this word. Does anybody know what this word means? And somebody would. Uh, and so it's because astrobiology is so interdisciplinary, I would say it's not a single area of study that you need to look for. It is a group of people who are all interested in the same grand astrobiological questions as you who come from different areas of study. So if you can craft that network of peers and friends, uh, that could be really beneficial learning astrobiology. Yeah, I love at the end of uh, your, your life paper, um, you had an acknowledgement to the, I think it was the Caltech Astrobiology Reading Group. Um, yeah. So it's cool to see that because like book clubs, journal clubs, they really can help in your own, your own learning and your own reading. For sure. 
Our next question comes from Rendering Reality 3D Animations on YouTube. They ask, uh, to understand climate change, we separate climate forcing and variability from human impact often. Um, how do long slash short term climate studies help us in understanding and searching for biosignatures? Wow, what a fantastic question. You know, I, I often say that, uh, you know, astrobiology, like science fiction, is the best when it is using far away questions to examine close to home issues, right? And habitability and climate is one of those. We can't ask about habitability of exoplanets without becoming acutely aware of the climate physics that is contributing to our own uh, you know, uh, uh, climate crisis right now and how we are kind of ruining the habitability of our own planet for ourselves. Um, and so that is, uh, now I've lost the question already. <laughs> what was the question? Basically, how do our, our current climate studies help us looking for biosignatures? Yeah. Okay. Well, so the, the, here's the great thing is that a lot of the tools that we use in climate science here for Earth get adapted for exoplanetary studies. So the general circulation models and the photo chemical models that were first developed and used to describe the variations on our own world, those mathematical and uh, computational tools are then ported to other planets. Because what you do is you just, you change the values in those equations, the parameters, the initial conditions to reflect not Earth, but an exo-Earth around some other star. Change the stellar input, like uh, like changing a light bulb, and and then you are simulating another world with, with potentially a different biosphere, different fluxes of gases. And that can tell you about what kinds of variations to look for on those planets. Um, and, and we try to model their evolution over time to know if they, you know, remain habitable over time and things like this. So it, it really is a, a tight knit community of people who are studying earth science, especially climate uh, and our atmosphere and those who are trying to understand the climates and habitability of other worlds. Yeah. And there's so many connections. Um, our next user, uh, Sila on YouTube, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, they basically want to know, and so in, in your life paper, you kind of have a description of, of life, you know, with an I and life with a, a Y. Mm -hmm. um, Sila wants to know with the, the NASA definition, as it's sometimes called, that life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Um, if you could just explain kind of that idea to them. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, right? So that's NASA's definition of life. And I think it's a very good definition for the kind of life that we see here on Earth. Now, the issue with uh, definitions, though, is it's hard to generalize from N equals one to that grander scope of things. That's what we attempt to do in the uh, the, the LYFE paper. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but some of the things that give me pause about NASA's definition um, which is a working definition, um, you know, acknowledging that, you know, it is something that can evolve and change with time with new discoveries, uh, is the, the idea that, okay, so it's maybe a chemical system, but, um, but does that mean, you know, maybe we should discount, uh, robotic life or, 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 um, in silico life, computer, uh, computerized life forms, um, and also capable of Darwinian evolution. Um, uh, what if there are other mechanisms of evolution that do not follow a precisely the Darwinian mold here on Earth. There's actually a really uh, interesting paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago by Professor Mohammed Noor, again, one of the science consultants for Star Trek, titled Thinking Outside Earth's Box, How Evolution and Heredity Could Differ on Other Worlds. And so this is, again, trying to imagine other possibilities that may fall slightly outside of the bounds of NASA's definition of life, because it doesn't strictly do Darwinian evolution per se, um, but but may nonetheless, you know, actually be what we would consider a living being when we take a, a kind of grander, more encompassing, more inclusive definition of life with a Y. Mm, very cool. Um, so we have a question from Imani Meta. They want to know how we could identify biological markers on exoplanets that differ from life as we know it. Um, how can we look for that? Yeah. So again, this uh, this this is about uh, developing what astrobiologists call agnostic biosignatures. Agnostic meaning that we can look for life not necessarily 
as our own. And so, again, this is all very intimately tied into our definition for life. And I love the idea of developing agnostic biosignatures because it actually really gets us to think about those fundamental principles of what life is. What do we expect life everywhere to do, no matter what kind of environment it is in that would classify it as life? And what are those things that we can then look for? Um, and so we hope that the network kind of biosignatures that we are developing right now will allow us to identify life forms that exist in different environments and affect their environment in slightly different ways, but still maintain a sort of like abstract kind of complexity uh, that makes it a, a, an identifiable living system that maybe maybe complexity or maybe information content can be uh, sort of a hallmark of life that is independent of specific molecules. Um, a lot of work still needs to be done in this area. Agnostic biosignatures is a relatively new science, um, and I'm sure we have, we'll have many updates for you in years to come. Awesome. Um, our next user, uh, Corvus on YouTube, wants to know if there's any, any work being done on theoretical biosignatures for silicon-based life. I will say first that I would recommend a review paper from Petkowski, Baines, and Seeger um, on the potential for silicon as a building block for life. They really did a great job kind of reviewing everything that we know right now based on chemistry about silicon-based life, if it's possible. Um, but, but Mike, is, is there any way of us to look for kind of silicon-based life on another world yet? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I was also going to point to that paper because, you know, again, an excellent review of the state of the art and our knowledge and sort of expectations and guesses for what silicon-based life could be like. Um, I think, again, uh, very similar to the previous question. If we are looking for silicon-based life, we're just life as we don't know it, uh, embedded in a different kind of substrate, well, uh, we would need to look for these kind of abstract principles of life that uh, aren't reliant on specific molecules themselves. I would also potentially throw out the provocative idea that we are creating silicon-based life right now through our technology. Uh, a lot of uh, thought has been given to the idea that maybe our technological entities are kind of like evolving in a very biological fashion. I saw a paper uh, recently about how if you make like a phylogenetic tree, uh, an evolutionary tree of computer code languages, it looks very much like um, the phylogenetic tree of uh, biological organisms, the tree of life that we all know. And, you know, when I was, uh, when I was young, we all had uh, iPods, right? We all walked around with iPods listening to music. These days, very few iPods exist because they were sort of uh, driven to extinction by these phone-like devices that do more than just allow you to listen to music, but also enable you to do all sorts of different functions. So we do see kind of like an evolutionary process occurring uh, through our our technology as well um, that is sort of like embedded upon or within our biosphere. So our technosphere and our biosphere are constantly co-evolving. Uh, and so, you know, that the, the, our silicon chips, our silicon-based devices might be silicon life, uh, um, uh, which is, you know, very different from like the Horta from Star Trek, uh, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, very intriguing and thought-provoking to think about. Awesome. Our next question comes from Arunava Padar on YouTube. Arunava basically is asking a question, kind of merging the concepts of life, as you presented, along with your idea of like a, a network concept for, for planetary systems. Arunava wants to know if there could be a definition of life based on an ordered network concept for a planetary system. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we're, we're working on, how uh, networks sort of reflect those fundamental pillars of life. Uh, can we see evidence for, for instance, homeostasis within uh, different networks? I think uh, we, we do absolutely at the biological scales, right? It would be a really bad network <laughs> if you just took out one node. So in a cell, maybe just one uh, um, metabolite, you took it out and the whole cell collapsed. It would be a really bad uh, neural network if, if suddenly one of your neurons shut off you couldn't think anymore. It'd be really a poor food web if you 
just took out one species and then the whole ecosystem collapses. And so at the same time, you know, maybe there is something at the planetary scale in our biogeochemical cycles where um, sort of like some kind of homeostasis is achieved, some kind of robustness to that network. Uh, and then this gets into the, again, intriguing and uh, provocative concept of the Gaia hypothesis, that what life does as it embeds itself into the geochemical systems is to actually prop them up and to keep them going, to maintain itself and to persist into the future. Um, and so, you know, again, open questions. We're working on them and we hope to have some more answers in the years to come. Awesome. We are getting very close to the top of the hour. We have just a few questions left. If you have a moment, I'd love to ask at least two of these remaining questions, maybe three. I'm, um, I'm game. Let's do it. Okay. This, this one question comes from Upgrade Me BB on YouTube. I'm not quite sure if I understand the question. They, they say, is it possible that because we may not understand alien technology, that something as large as a star may be inorganic? Um, I think what they're asking is, could it be that something as large as a star might be living? Mm -hmm. um, ah. Okay. Oh, I love this question because uh, when I was teaching astrobiology um, to college students, one of the one of the first things activities that we did was, can you define life, right? So I, I ask all the students to write down their own definition, and then they get in groups and share their definitions with their groups and come up with a group definition that they can all agree upon. And then the groups write their definitions on the whiteboard and then hear uh, responses and criticisms from the rest of the class. And what struck me was that nearly every single one of those definitions that the groups came up with stars satisfied. <laughs> right? And I was like, Oh my God, like our stars alive. I don't think we should consider stars alive. Um, but it really pointed out how stars are what Stuart Bartlett and I would call sub life, sub life of the Y, because they do perform some of the pillars of life, um, but not all of them. And so the main one that I think they're missing is learning, right? They don't do information processing. They don't do the kind of evolution that where they can pass on information, things like that, although stars do evolve in a chemical sense, um, they don't uh, they, they don't do harness information in the way that we would expect a living system to do. But they are, you know, uh, different phenomena in the universe do similar things to life, and so we should consider ourselves as a part of a larger family of complex systems, uh, maybe one that just does all four of these pillars rather than two of them or three of them. Awesome. Um, our next question comes from Muhoodles uh, on YouTube. Muhoodles also is, is a Twitch streamer um, and has a great presence on, on social media. Um, she wants to know, uh, she says, one, it's been awesome. Um, and then they want to know, what exact programming have you done? So they're a software engineer and would love to help with any astrobiology stuff that they can. So what kind of realm of programming would you recommend for someone who wants to get involved in astrobiology work? Do you know Fortran? Because <laughs> a lot of our models uh, are, are, are are built in in Fortran, um, and you know we do. So when I say programming, you know we're running these very highly complex models for simulating all of the physics and the chemistry in uh, for for myself in particular planetary atmospheres, but other people you know do the interiors of planets and other things like that. Uh, and and so these are all you know complex computer models that solve hundreds of couple differential equations. Um, and so, you know, every once in a while the program breaks or it crashes or, you know, we get a segmentation fault and those are no fun to diagnose, but Hey, you know, if, if you want to help, let's, uh, let's chat. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, for those who ask other questions, I do apologize, but we are running over on time a little bit now. Um, I love this last question though. Uh, Kashish Gupta on YouTube has asked, um, Throughout your, your career as an astrobiologist and planetary science uh, scientist up until now, what is your favorite scientific tool or technique with which you've worked or want to work in the future? Wow. Oh, my goodness. Uh, what a great question. I would love to... Uh, I'm going to answer this from the, what do I want to work on in the future? I would love to be able to work on, say, samples from 
say Enceladus, you know, the Enceladus Orbilander that, uh, that the latest decadal survey uh, has recommended be built, launched, and sent to Enceladus to look for biosignatures. Wouldn't it be great to get some of those samples and then really analyze them and see uh, if any of our like complexity techniques for looking for life actually can be uh, found in, in those types of samples. Uh, right now, what we're doing at Carnegie actually is a really exciting project where we are analyzing all sorts of, um, you know, kinds of materials, uh, living and non-living samples here on Earth and running them through the exact same kind of instrument that will be flown to Europa on the Europa Clipper uh, to try to identify whether or not there are certain patterns in the chemistry that are indicative of life versus non-life. Um, so that kind of excitement where you're getting something raw from another world and asking, is there life there directly is something that I hope to be able to do in my career. Awesome. You have to keep boldly going. Yep. So, uh, so thank you so much, Mike. And th thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, you can always reach out to us on Twitter at NASA Astrobio at Seganorg or find me at Cosmobiologist. You can also drop us a line at Seganet.org. Uh, a fun question I have for the audience who are watching now, you can answer now on YouTube uh, or you know, send us an email or, or hit us up on Twitter. Uh, what science fiction shows or movies, novels, or, or other works of fiction do you think have the best representation of astrobiology as a science. And that could be astrobiologists. It could be the study of alien life, the kinds of aliens they're finding. Um, just let us know what you think. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Michael Wong, you can follow him on Twitter at Mikwai. Uh, it's at M-I-Q-U-A-I. Uh, and it also links to his website there in his profile. Um, we also recommend, uh, highly recommend, checking out the podcast Strange New Worlds uh, in your favorite podcast player. Uh, so once again, Mike, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Thanks so much for having me. This has been a blast. Yeah, it's been great. Um, and for those of you out there who might want to stay in the loop on upcoming episodes of Ask an Astrobiologist, or even find out more information about opportunities and events and things like that with NASA Astrobiology, uh, the NASA Astrobiology program does a lot of really cool stuff. So you can use the link on your screen to sign up for the official mailing list to get lots of information from NASA Astrobiology. Uh, so thank you all for joining in. And until next time, as always, stay curious.